Well, thank you once again for joining us at Inside Arabia. It's uh, truly a present pleasure to speak with you. Thank and, you. Um, you are an analyst for Gulf State Analytics. Um, you specialize in the Middle East and North Africa. You've uh, written some very informative articles for us. And uh, you also have do done some uh, videos recently discussing some of the factors around the Arab Spring, and particularly Tunisia, the progress mm -hmm. making um, towards becoming a democratic state. I thought it would be nice to just start off with some details on what the like common social political factors were that led up to the Arab Spring, because I think sometimes um, from the outside looking in, if you saw the events of like the protests and things like that, you may not particularly have insight on some of the things that led up to that um, public outrage and all of the like events and uh, factors that happened during the Arab Spring. Yes, thank you for uh, speaking to me today. Um, well, the, the Arab Spring is, first of all, I think we can start by trying to define the term. Why did they call it an Arab Spring? It was supposedly uh, going to be a movement uh, of de democratization and liberalization that uh, parallel to or similar to what happened in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. So you had uh, uh, various, uh, all the communist countries gradually um, replacing the regimes with uh, democratic ones uh, based around uh, European systems allowing for capitalism and uh, general liberalism in, in the in that sense. And now, um, I thought at the time I mean, the idea was cute, but um, not accurate, because if you look at the individual circumstances that uh, produced revolts in those countries, they're quite different. You don't have it wasn't the same idea uh, as uh, Eastern Europe, where, which was that the, the movement was triggered by one event, one crucial event, that then released a sort of, a, let's call it a metaphoric yoke from, from those countries, allowing them to go back to their pre-World War II uh, situation, after all. I mean, these countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, had semi-democratic systems in place before World War II, before the Soviet Union uh, incorporated them in, their, in its satellite, uh, as satellites and in its sphere. Um, so uh, in the case of uh, the Middle East and North Africa, there wasn't, there wasn't such a background. Uh, these countries will have to, and I say will have to because they haven't yet built, built their democratic systems from scratch which is part of the difficulty of, of the transition. Um, so uh, that said, there were some, I think the, what happened in Tunisia, which was, uh, did have a, a sort of uh, um, dictatorship of sorts, although less the, um, intense than others in the region, uh, did have a psychological effect, which perhaps encouraged uh, other uh, citizens in Arab countries to uh, imitate it uh, in, in some way. And um, there was a, an element of technology um, which facilitated it. For example, you, some people speak of the Arab Spring as the uh, tech spring you know, or the, the social media spring. They use social media platforms to organize events at a rapid rate so that uh, uh, the government would not have enough time to to stop the gathering uh, of large numbers of people in key areas of cities uh, and the country. Um, but uh, what happened in Syria um, and certainly in Libya, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in the countries that were so-called grouped together at the Arab Spring, each one has different circumstances and a different outcome, different purpose to the revolt. So um, I think it's important to distinguish, to look at each case individually. And uh, of those cases, however, Tunisia is uh, unique. 
given the uh, um, what's happening now. It's really had the most. It's the the one country of in that group that is really ha has truly experienced a spring, um, and it it is evolving in. Um, it's evolving in a, um, in a way that you, it won't be going back to that system uh, any uh, any any more. So it, it's reached a momentum or critical mass. So um, the process of democratization in Tunisia is proceeding. The other countries, uh, I don't think so. That's really interesting because it it almost seemed like sort of like a ripple effect. Um, with the countries having these like mass protests and demanding change and reform from their government. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting to hear that like the circumstances in, in each country were so vastly different, but they were still able to be like inspired by what was happening by uh, other countries in the region. Could you explain a little bit more about what makes Tunisia um, distinct and why it seems to have made more progress than uh, other countries that were involved in the Arab Spring? Well, Tunisia is, is unique in various ways. The first way is that Tunisia, unlike other Arab countries, had a strong independent union, the UGTT, which was uh, very involved from the beginning um, since the start of the, um, the, the, the Tunisian Spring is uh, said to begin with the, the, uh, the death of uh, Mohammed Bouazizi, who the, the uh, young worker, actually he sold uh, food from a cart in a small little town, Sidi Bouazid, in uh, uh, about 150 kilometers south of Tunis. Uh, I actually visited the, the town a few weeks after the, uh, after, uh, the, the spring was in March of um, 2011 um, and um, the, the union was deeply involved after his death and in, in, I believe it, it happened in December uh, of that year of 2010 uh, and the, there was a, st a strong movement throughout not just one city Tunis but throughout the country so there was a national momentum of protest against the government um, and of course, I would add another um, uh, trigger to the revolt. We had the um, financial crisis of 2007, 2008, which reached a peak uh, in Europe. I mean, this was a worldwide financial crisis, but it reached a peak in Europe around 2009. And there was a, it really hit back, it really, uh, the financial crisis in 2008 um, really hurt uh, the Mediterranean countries, uh, Italy, Spain, France. As it happens, these are the countries that invested the most in countries like Tunisia, Morocco, and so on. In, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, companies had, for example, textile factories, uh, uh, the Italian textile factories were in Tunisia, other uh, industrial facilities, and so on, and also tourism. A lot of most of the tourism to Tunisia, we, and Tunisia live, is um, dependent, ha highly dependent on tourism. Something like ten percent of its GDP is uh, derived from tourism. So you had a slowdown of investment, and really the economic uh, triggers were uh, substantial. Um, so you had a strong union, con um, which was pro already began. Uh, to organize protests and um, th by the time the union um, reached Tunis uh, with a major general strike uh, that was on the 14th of January 2011 the date when uh, the former president uh, Ben Ali decided to leave the country and that is the other unique feature of that period rather th you Ben Ali should get credit because uh, rather than inflict pain on his population and the protracted social uh, uh, civil war potentially or certainly social unrest, he decided to leave, to resign 
he fled to Saudi Arabia and um, allowed the institutions to adjust so that um, in, in many cases, many of the former parliamentarians in Tunis um, actually took uh, positions in the new government. So th there was less of a power vacuum. And then you had Tunisia also um, opposition groups, uh, an Islamic opposition group uh, existed for a long time. Uh, uh, it became the Anahda party, but it was a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was um, already, um, um, uh, it's, it was different than the, than the Egyptian equil equivalent. It was a little bit more moderate and more open to compromise. So you, so you had a, a number of uh, th these various factors and, uh, that contributed to making the Tunisian um, revolt successful. And um, really, in the end, uh, the deaths uh, resulting uh, did not come from the revolt itself, but the few the events uh, uh, that followed. And that really wasn't due to the political situation. It was due to what was happening around Tunisia. I was, and I'm talking about the terrorist episodes. Now, you can blame the, uh, the other factors, but generally uh, the, the problem that the Tunisian, that all these transitions had, but the Tunisian one as well, um, is the um, economic one. The, um, even when they made the political transition to democracy, the economy w was not strong enough to sustain this transition. And there was not enough aid coming in to sustain it. Because um, Tunisia, unlike uh, other Arab co countries or certain Arab countries, does not have considerable uh, resources of note. It doesn't have much oil. And what oil there is, is just has recently started to be explored and developed. And uh, so um, it's a country uh, that relied on itself, on its own people, which also made a difference. There was more of a middle class, I would say, in Tunisia, in the, in the Western sense, because people had, it wasn't a country built on oil. It was a country built on small businesses, um, uh, individual enterprise, agriculture. Uh, Tunisia does not have resources, but it has a, a very a much more vibrant agricultural sector given the, the geography uh, and, and tourism. So um, the, the very rather unique factors have uh, made Tunisia what it is. You've done a two-part series for Inside Arabia mm -hmm. where you go in depth about um, what you say is like exceptional progress that mm -hmm. Tunisia has made in its uh, process to become a democratic state. And so you mentioned the Anakta party mm -hmm. and how Tunisia is successfully um, separating religion and state, Tunisia being a predominantly Muslim country. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, particularly because um, that seems to be something that has been um, a difficult factor to overcome for a lot of countries mm -hmm. um, within the region, within the MENA region? Well, uh, again, Tunisia is exceptional situation. Um, you have uh, uh, the, uh, a, a Muslim party, a Muslim Brotherhood party, the Anahda, founded by Rashid Ghanouchi, who is still alive today. And in fact, I believe was president for a while. Um, and Tunisia has had several elections since 2011. But and, and governments have been dissolved and, and, and reformed, but generally there is a pattern. Elections have taken hold. So the, gar the, the people understand that political transitions will occur through elections and um, that their vote in some ways counts because we've had different winners, different losers. Um, you have the, the, the strength of a, a constitution can take place. And uh, the idea of a constitution is not typical of, of the region. Um, but you've had compromises on both, on two ends. Um, and that I think is the key. On the one uh, end, the uh, Ennahda party has decided to uh, become less formal in its religious, in the religious application of laws or state. So it's become tolerant of 
many of the secular uh, attitudes that were ingrained in Tunisia since the foundation of the country by President Bourguiba in the 1957, I don't remember, but it was exactly. But I think we have to go talk about uh, uh, Bourguiba as the founder. He established Tunisia uh, um, according to, although independent from France because Tunisia was a French colony, uh, but he absorbed many of the French civil uh, code uh, aspects. So in many ways, Tunisia was for, had been, perhaps the most secular country in uh, the Arab world, the most secular Arab country. Well, that and Syria also vies for that position and Lebanon. But uh, Tunisia ha had it ingrained. Um, so uh, so as, when the uh, more traditional, when the Nahda party came in, it did not... Uh, uh, violently, let's say, or, or rapidly uh, expurge or uh, eliminate all the secular traditions, which include uh, the, perhaps the most uh, rights that women have anywhere in the, in, in the Arab world, including, um, I believe they even have the right of abortion in, uh, in Tunisia. And certainly they have the right to, declare, to call for divorce. And uh, anyway, they, they have rights similar to uh, French women. Okay. And, and Nahada has not affect, touched these rights. Uh, so they've made a compromise. The only, on the other hand, you've also had the compromise from the secular parties to accept the, uh, the various electoral victories and gains made by Nahada. You didn't have protests uh, in the streets as happened, for example, in Algeria in 1992. Going back to that, Arab Spring discussion at the beginning. If you want to talk about first country to have a true democratic revolt or process in in Middle East and North Africa, I would have to say Algeria, because in nineteen in the nineteen uh, uh, in the early nineteen nineties, Algeria went through a democratic transition, which brought to power an Islamic party, the FIS. Uh, but this FIS was uh, scared a number of secular forces in, the, in Algeria. And uh, those forces never allowed the feast to take power. So they brought in the army, uh, which was a coup, and then uh, triggered in, um, a civil war that killed, uh, by the time it was over, in 2000, 2001, 150,000 people. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so that was the, what I, again, going back, that was the, the good thing that Ben Ali did. He did not try to repress that the change that was that had bubbled in fact i when i think about it, it is extremely remarkable what he what he did and he doesn't get enough credit for it um but uh, in, in tunisia you have you've had this compromise and i think uh, more importantly um, i think tunisia and i've written about this has the chance really to make um, a pioneering contribution an islamic uh, based inspired parties such as Ennahda, um, but that could set the model for the rest of the region. It doesn't have to be necessarily, it can, it can keep an Islamic character um, in the same way that uh, Christian democratic parties in Europe, particularly after World War II, uh, led the reconstruction. So it, it has, um, um, uh, it's, there are compromises on both sides, and that is politics. The, the politics is happening in, in Tunisia. So there is a dialogue, uh, and through this dialogue, something unique can emerge, uh, setting it uh, really apart from everything else. Other countries uh, in the region are, for example, I think Morocco, under the guidance of the constitutional monarch, uh, uh, can evolve in a similar direction. And you have a process of uh, political change also happening in Algeria, but these are independent. These have come later and also there are evolutions of previous uh, processes. Certainly, I think in that area from Tunisia to uh, Morocco, we are, I, think, I see positive change in, in, in the Maghreb. Uh, Egypt, 
another situation. <laughs> so you, you're breaking down the different um, factors that have helped Tunisia move towards separating um, religion and state. And but while keeping religion. While keeping religion. But this is the unique aspect. In other words, they, trying to please, they've done a good job, and it's a difficult one, it's not finished, but they've done a good job of trying to compromise, finding like a Lego block, you know, you find the right place to put the two together. And it's going to take a while, but it's, it's on its way, I think. I think that's really great that you point that out, that they're finding a compromise, because a lot of times, uh, particularly in Western media, I think the MENA region is just discussed with like a broad stroke. Mm -hmm. And the perception of Arab countries in particular, predominantly Muslim countries in particular, in the way that um, the religion is upheld socially that affects different freedoms and things of that nature. So could you talk a little bit about how this um, process towards finding a compromise um, has played a role socially in Tunisia? What are, what are things like there socially in doing this process? Well, um, as I mentioned in, in Tunisia, the social uh, dynamics have not changed considerably. Um, you, you have the, the, the secular uh, structure of the country has remained uh, as such. The, 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 the laws are secular. You, um, there are no demands on clothing, for example. Um, there are no demands on, on fasting during Ramadan. Uh, this was something, this is, this is something uh, unique in, in, in Tunisia. It, it goes back to, uh, there was a, I believe there may even still a video uh, available. President Bourguiba in 1961 uh, urging Tunisians not to fast during Ramadan because they needed to be strong to build the country. You can't, I can't imagine that anywhere else happening in the Middle East. And Bourguiba was president until 1986, um, I believe, and Ben Ali took over in 87. So he was a, a, someone who lasted for a long time establishing as a true father of the nation, still respected today. And he, he instilled very secular values in the country. And uh, the, 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 the opposition parties, is the, well, now the main party, Ennahda, has not uh, tried to do something at the beginning, but realized they're not going to change that character in Tunisia. So they'd stopped even trying. And, and that's where uh, they've made a bit, an important compromise. Uh, and they've, but they're holding on to power. So they can apply Islamic values, I think, in areas that count, that are more important, where, where they can be very beneficial, particularly in finance and banking. I, I think actually the West could learn quite a bit from Islamic finance in, in the, uh, given the, uh, econo our economic times and the uh, dominance of finance in, in the economy. Um, so in, in, uh, in the Islamic uh, banking and finance, there are fewer risks. Mm. And too much risk taking has led us to situations such as 2008 uh, in, in, on Wall Street. So, uh, I mean, I'm generalizing, but uh, I'm, uh, there are things we could learn. And that is actually one of the things I hope that Tunisia uh, uh, Tunisian success can do is that we can set such an example that uh, maybe the West looks to it as well and um, we can learn something from from Ennahda. Why not? It can really help bridge the two worlds, uh, East and West or Islam and, and uh, the West, uh, which I think is uh, overdue but in concrete ways, not in just beautiful speeches, such as the one Obama did in, in uh, Cairo in 2009. Yeah, something more, let's put some meat on that. I think that's really interesting um, to consider, not only the influence of Tunisia in the region, but also globally. Potentially, yes. I, I think Tunisia should be a, an imp is an important case. It, it deserves a lot of uh, favorable attention. 
particularly like in your your second article, you said that Tunisia has um, always endorsed or traditionally endorsed a progressive mm -hmm. vision for Islam. Um, how do you think that uh, Tunisia's vision for Islam has shaped things regionally as far as other countries? I think you mentioned Morocco being influenced by this process that uh, Tunisia is going through. Do you think that that also has had some influence in the region? Well, I think Morocco is, is um, credit goes to the monarch for having, um, because Morocco was not part of that list of countries that experienced the so-called spring. It, it had some minor, it had some protests, nothing to the extent of, the, of others, of other countries. But the, uh, to, Morocco was part of a general ongoing process uh, that has happened actually in other monarchies as well. Um, Qatar and um, uh, Kuwait and, and Jordan, where mon uh, the, uh, monarchs have given more power to their prime ministers, allowing for election, now the prime ministers generally get chosen by the monarch, but parliament is elected, and the the, the, the prime ministers have more power. So the the monarch is not absolute anymore. Um, uh, there is a, a a process of constitutional monarchy going taking place, and democratic uh, processes are exist. So, um, and I I think the uh, certainly. Um, well, the, the type of Islam in Morocco is, there are differences. You have different schools, different juridical uh, uh, schools. Uh, there are four general ones in Islam. But um, I think um, where Tunisia can teach, what Tunisia can teach other countries is how to achieve the compromise between maintaining an Islamic uh, uh, character in the party, which I think is very important. It's very important for any successful transition to statehood, not just democracy, in the Middle East, to uh, remain loyal to the cultural roots, which is the, which per, I think is part of much of the problems of the Middle East. Go back to that; they've started from scratch, without uh, and the secular parties have sort of um, not have eliminated or taken out is Islam out of the equation instead of including it and uh, to build as a base uh, uh, as as the root uh, so they've sort of uh, you've ha you have uh, it's like having a building without foundations uh, that's how uh, many middle eastern and north african countries were but more so the middle eastern ones north african ones uh, had more independence because of the distance I think the physical distance from the Ottoman Empire allowed them to become more independent earlier. Okay. So, and I think Turkey, for example, is what's happening in Turkey now after decades of pure secularism enforced by Ataturk. The new president Erdogan is, wants to establish the country on a solid Muslim foundation, um, bringing, um, and I don't, he's been criticized for this, but I don't think he's entirely wrong. I think there are interesting, intelligent uh, reasons, sociological and cultural reasons for doing so. I think um, it gives the people a kind of uh, self-confidence. Um, if you look, think of, of a family, a family that lives through its traditions and, can, and is strong and confident can live anywhere. And, and keep united under under stress as well because they have a something in common. There's some there's a something uniting them beyond material or whatever beyond the changes of the exterior. And I think that's what the Middle East needs. So I think Tunisia is discovering the a secret. I don't know a formula a recipe to achieve that. And that's why I I. I um, I, I think it deserves uh, a lot of attention uh, as a model. And, and um, um, Syria might, will, whenever that civil, well, I don't even want to call it civil war. I think it's a war of, by proxy. Yeah. But whenever it's ready to come together, and it is, 
I think um, it won't last it unless it goes through this kind of process as, as well. Because um, there are, um, the, the Islamic traditions have been repressed in the name of modernity and modernity did not bring all that was promised to these countries. It did not make anyone richer. Many people still suffer in these countries and uh, a new approach is necessary. You can't go back to the same, uh, the same formulas anymore. You, you've raised so many um, intriguing points and um, really given us a great context around what's happening in Tunisia, what makes it um, distinct from other countries who are involved in what's known as the Arab Spring. Uh, especially discussing this idea of compromise between religion and state and not doing away with necessarily Islam, but mm -hmm. finding a way to incorporate it and also yes. the population feel like they have a voice, that they're involved in this process. Mm -hmm. so to kind of um, bring our discussion full circle, how would you describe or where would you say Tunisia is at today and um, just any final thoughts that you have on where Tunisia stands regionally? Well, um, Tunisia today, I think, and I, I believe this even before the, uh, the so-called Arab Spring. I think Tunisia in some ways is lucky. It's lucky that it did not have the oil for example, that its, that its neighbor uh, Libya did. It's lucky that it's not located in the Middle East uh, near uh, areas of um, ge geopolitical um, uh, interest uh, located between Iran, Saudi Arabia, you can imagine oil fields, different forces. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's uh, right. It's a little wedge, right uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean, at the, the uh, not even at the further south. So, uh, it can benefit from uh, natural historical beauty, and so it can attract tourism. It has the right social, political climate to to attract tourists. Uh, it has um, great, uh, given the Arab context, agriculture. So mo many Arab countries can, cannot say the same. They need to import all foods. I, I lived in Libya. I know all food, most food was imported. And uh, despite Gaddafi's best efforts to navigate the area through very complex uh, systems like the Great Miami River, Tunisia doesn't need that. Tunisia even has rainfall. Uh, it has uh, different seasons. It has, uh, it's a much more temperate uh, weather, for example, uh, than other areas. So in some ways, it's quite, shall we say, blessed. Um, but I think its greatest blessing is that it doesn't have oil. In other words, it forces the population to develop its own skills and rely on um, creating things rather than living off rent. It's not a rentier state. So uh, that favors the kind of uh, political process that leads that that uh, makes a democracy uh, work. Um, imagine any Western country. Um, if you have, if the, such a Western country has a substantial amount of its revenue coming in from oil, uh, from or from whatever resource, just an external uh, sort, uh, 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 some resource that does not require much work to extract or at least uh, and re really that benefits only a few people because for example the oil industry is very small right. um, so you you would um, have a situ a very problematic social uh, situation um, you'd have lots of people out of work perhaps they would be gaining some kind of salary as they do in Saudi Arabia but uh, in general, it, it's not an, something that you can build a society on. Norway has oil, and it's used it very intelligently. Uh, it's, uh, it, you, it puts its funds in a, um, it invests the funds, it has a huge sovereign fund, and uses the profits or the interest on that fund to uh, pay for unbelievable social services for the country. But Norway has a very small population, 
and also a, a very interesting uh, social uh, the demography demographic uh, arrangement where most of the population is in the south so and the oil fields are in the north but I think in Tunisia, the, this, the lack of oil has um, just created a more even social uh, class. Uh, fewer differences between rich and poor. Now, these differences do exist, but they're not quite as accentuated as in other uh, Arab countries. Um, so it has um, the, the, the foundations to build a um, uh, to use them, them in, I'm talking in the Marxist terms, class structures, uh, which which uh, allow for um, political, at least political dialogue. Uh, among, uh, so that is, um, I think, the key, um, one of the important things of Tunisia. And, and that's why um, political dialogue, even between Islamic forces and secular forces can uh, occur. Unfortunately, it, there are challenges. Many people, there's still unemployment. Uh, and I think uh, the COVID situation with uh, Mediterranean, particularly Mediterranean Europe, uh, having suffered considerably, and we, don't, we still don't know what kind of damage that will affect tourism. And uh, yeah, the, uh, but. Any regional influences that uh, may be threatened by? Yes. Factor? Yeah. There are uh, the the instability in Libya is definitely uh, a problem um, because of uh, very bad, um, very low salaries and unemployment in Tunisia. A number of unemployed young men have found work uh, uh, in um, the various uh, militias uh, in Libya, fighting the, in in the war there. Some say ISIS. A lot of the ISIS members in um, uh, Libya uh, have come from Tunisia and uh, literally because they are given a salary. And um, a few days ago, um, a boat of migrants arrived from, uh, from Tunisia to the Italian island of Lampedusa. So even in COVID times, we have the uh, migration phenomenon. During the Ben Ali years, these phenomena were controlled. There were, was more uh, political, more government restriction on outflows. That uh, after the 2011 uh, revolution, the Jasmine Revolution, so-called, we've had more of these, more migrants, uh, which is to be expected in in a transition. Uh, but I, I think um, that de definitely economics. Uh, makes a, is an important uh, factor in determining the success or failure of uh, political uh, uh, projects. And it, Tunisia is at risk, but I think the foundations has, are deep now. I don't think they're going back to, uh, on, whereas other countries um, are, are still uh, at risk. Alessandro, thank you so much for your insight, uh, for speaking with us and uh, discussing so many unique factors that are taking place in Tunisia. It's really interesting to discuss and learn more about. And um, would you, do you have any final thoughts or anything that you wanted to point out before we wrap up? Well, um, I think um, the most important thing to, when you analyze the Arab Spring and even in Tunisia uh, to, uh, is that um, it's not it's, every country has a unique situation that you cannot it's not something that can explain that the what happened in Egypt is not what happened in Tunisia uh, and Tunisia is what it what it is it has it's because of its unique characteristics Syria was completely different, and 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 uh, but and this is a problem in Western media is to paint everything with the same brush. It's not the first time. I remember uh, I'm old enough to remember when the Iranian Revolution happened and the analyses that followed. The, the fear that it was that the Iranian Revolution would spread to the Middle East uh, and create. Uh, but the Iranian Revolution was also the product of unique circumstances. 
and you did not have any other country experience the same thing, even though there was unrest, for even in Lebanon, for example. Uh, um, each country, uh, 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 Lebanon has an important Shiite uh, population, uh, and uh, important representatives of that population, Hezbollah and Namal. Well, but each country has unique circumstances which produced that situation. So I, I think for any viewers, anyone, always look um, uh, at the individual countries and, and uh, whenever you hear of uh, a broad phenomenon that's affecting the regions. Yes, there may be some, something to it, uh, by all means, but uh, if you look deep down, there's always uh, uh, different uh, explanations for why something is happening in, uh, in the country. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, thank you for reminding us and, and going into depth about what makes Tunisia unique mm -hmm. and sharing your insight with us. Um, we really appreciate it and we are so thankful to have you not only in this interview but as a contributor to Inside Arabia. Um, thank you. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., you'll come visit us. Oh, uh, by all means. Thank you. <laughs>